The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the second chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. It's Ephesians chapter 2. I'll be reading verses 11 through 22 there this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who were called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace. And might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, we pray to hear your words and not mine. Your words that call us, that shape us, that change us more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus the Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> One of my favorite storytellers, a name you've probably heard me mention at least once or twice, and naturally one of my favorite preachers, is a man by the name of Fred Craddock. And one of the stories that I heard Craddock tell once involved some old church somewhere in the deep south. I believe it may have been in eastern Tennessee. I can't remember exactly where, and I couldn't find where he had written it down. I think it was a yarn he spun just once in the pulpit. This antique church, he told us, was quite proud of its heritage. In particular, the folks of that church loved to tell this story about how one Christmas Eve, during the height of the Civil War, There was a battle that was taking place not too far from that little church. And the fighting was intense. Many men had been wounded and the sounds of cannon and gunfire could be heard for miles around. But that night, as the church was preparing to hold its Christmas Eve service, soldiers from both sides showed up at the church. They laid their rifles on the porch and they went inside. And folks would say, they didn't sit in Union on one side and Confederacy on the other. No, no, no. There were blue and gray uniforms mixed all in the pews, sitting next to each other as they sang Silent Night and listened to the nativity story from Luke's Gospel. The story goes that the men worshipped together, and after they had prayed and received the benediction, they went back outside, picked their rifles up off the porch, walked out into the field, and commenced to shooting at one another again. Craddock told this story because he had had the privilege to hear it from the folks of that church himself as he had been the guest preacher at that church when he was a young man. And he said just about every person in that church would tell that story, almost tell it exactly the same. But it was after his sermon that morning that he noticed something was a little off. Craddock was standing at the back on that porch, the same porch, where the soldiers had left their guns. He preached in that church, the same building, they told him. 
as where those soldiers had gathered to worship on that Christmas Eve, to worship the newborn king, to sing his praises. Craddock stood at the, on that porch, and as people came out and said, good sermon, preacher, good sermon. As people were wondering about where they were going to go eat lunch, Craddock looked over and he noticed it. Down at the bottom of the sanctuary, the little cornerstone in the building, said something to the effect of, First Christian Church established 1867. You obviously don't know your history. (laughs) They missed the Civil War by a good two years. It was clear. This never happened. This was not a real story. I mean, surely someone besides Craddock had noticed the cornerstone, right? With its chiseled proclamation of the church's founding year, surely there was someone in that little church who knew that their story was fake, not true. And maybe, and most likely, the inflation of a story from another church they heard sometime, somewhere. So why keep telling that story? Why keep telling that kind of story? Well, one, it's a good story, right? I mean, you all were like, yeah, it's a good story. It's a story that reminds us, I think, at least a little about what the kingdom of God might actually look like. Soldiers laying down their rifles, sitting side by side to worship. It might be false, but it's a good story. A story that gives us some small glimmer of hope that maybe, just maybe, there's a way past the things that seek to divide us. And if there was ever such a time when we needed to hear that kind of story, that kind of story about hope past division, it's now. Of course, for all the rhetoric revolving around how divided we as a people are, for all the talks about Democrats and Republicans, elites and the working class, rich and poor, none of it's new. As long as there have been two folks in this world, there has been an imaginary line drawn, a chasm created that causes each of us to see an alteration in appearance, a a variance of opinion, a discrepancy in biology, or a difference in location of our birth as grounds for animosity. You are different than me. And so we draw a line. Such a truth is recorded in one of the foundational narratives of our Bible, of our scripture. When Cain kills his brother Abel because he's jealous that God might have liked his offering just a little bit better. As long as folks have been in the world, folks have fought. We've gone to war. We've drawn borders. We've built walls and weapons of mass destruction. We've thrown stones and insults. We've sold each other as property and subsequently treated each other as such. We've hurled curses and hand grenades at each other. We've posted signs and installed special water fountains. We've passed laws and bombed churches. As long as there have been folks, there have been folks fighting. As long as we've noticed even the slightest difference, there has been someone somewhere who sought to exploit it, to use it and weaponize it to crack the chasm even wider between us. So division is nothing new. It's as old as humankind itself. But that's why we tell those kinds of stories. That's why we tell stories like the one that old church told. It's why we tell stories about folks of all stripes coming together in the wake of a natural disaster. It's why we tell stories about reunions. It's why we love stories about forgiveness and reconciliation, because it reminds us that this ideal of hope we have is not so far gone that we can't take a hold of it. It's the hope, the hope that Paul proclaims in the text that we've read this morning. Because division isn't new. Division was just as rampant, maybe even more vicious, even in Paul's day, especially when it came to religion. 
The Jewish people believed they were the chosen people of God. They had their scriptures and their covenants of Abraham, Moses, and David to prove it. See, we are the people of God. The Bible says. That's what they said. They had been God's people. They were the ones who had suffered for generations under the oppression of foreign powers. They were the ones who built God's temple in Jerusalem. And so they were the ones who were going to get first dibs on God's blessings. But then come this, this, this band of people following this rabbi from Nazareth, this Jesus, proclaiming that he has made a way even for the Gentiles. That God has sought to reconcile unto God's self even those who had not been seen as a part of Abraham's covenant. Those whose ancestors had helped oppress the people of God, destroyed their temple, and scattered them across the face of the, of the known world. Can you imagine for generations being told you are the people of God and now somebody comes along and saying they're all in too? It doesn't take much of an imagination for you to see why it isn't exactly good news to these ancient Jews. Of course, the Gentiles, that's the Greeks, the Romans, every other non-Jewish folks, they weren't exactly lining up to get in good with God's people. At best, they viewed them as an odd bunch. You know, they only worship one God, and they don't even know what he looks like. We got a bunch. Heck, I got little statues of them on my chest of drawers in my bedroom. They don't even know what their God looks like, they thought. They had strict rules and odd practices like circumcision. Who comes up with that? At worst... At worst, they viewed them as pests, as people who were so hung up on their religion that they needed to be removed. They needed to be kept in line, oppressed, or just flat out exterminated in order to keep the peace in the empire. So one could understand, one could understand when the Christians come on the scene and start saying to Gentiles, guess what? You get to be in with those people now. You can understand. Well, there might have been some difficulty in trying to reconcile these groups, especially by way of some seemingly new religion. But it's Paul, Paul the apostle to the Gentiles, who sees this reconciliation not as a nice idea, not as a novelty, but as absolutely necessary in understanding the gospel of Christ. For Paul, without this present physical reconciliation of all people, the eternal spiritual reconciliation is just pie-in-the-sky nonsense. I mean, couldn't you hear it? Couldn't you hear it in his words? But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he's made both groups into one, broken down the dividing wall, abolished the law and commandments and ordinances that have kept us apart, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace. That God might reconcile both groups in one body through the cross, putting to death hostility through it. Isn't that wonderful? For Paul, Christ has made a new way of reconciliation for both Jews and Gentiles. A way around, over, through, beyond. A way that unites both sides in its common humanity. A way that reminds both sides that they are, at the end of it all, human beings. Brothers and sisters, children of God. Both sides. Everyone children of God. I think, I think we need to be reminded of that too. Because it's too easy. It's too easy, I suppose, to see difference in another and use it to create only more difference. To call attention to it. To hold it up as the core of the curse that separates us. And maybe, maybe it's our own brokenness that makes us do it, our own securities that cause us to seek out the, a different shade of melanin in someone's skin, a, a slight shift in the language that they speak, or, or an apparent, apparent contradiction of ideologies. 
But whatever it is, and I tend to think it's that same old thing it always is, that sin of all sins, selfishness. But whatever it is, it cannot help but create distance to push someone else far off while we, while we think we're still near. It cannot help but widen the chasm that seeks to separate us, leaving us far off from our sisters and brothers. And it's why I think we need to hear these kinds of words from the Apostle Paul, words from Scripture, not just today in a sermon, but every time we're tempted to look at someone else, anyone else, as different, as other, as far off from where we are. Because Paul says, So Christ came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through Him both of us have access in one Spirit to the Father. And then he says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built on what? The foundation of the prophets and the apostles with Christ Jesus Himself as the cornerstone. It's in Him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. It's in Him you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Paul says Christ seeks to tear down the things that separate us and build up this dwelling place for God. It seems to me that God prefers to build houses over fences. That God, through Christ, has united us, every last one of us, together. That God, through Christ, has shown us that the way of heaven may actually be found in the renewed friendship of brothers and sisters on this side of eternity just as much as it is on the next. Jesus, Paul says, in His flesh has made both groups into one and broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. For Paul, both groups were Jews and Gentiles. That is, the Jews and everyone else. For Clarence Jordan, when he wrote his translation of this, it was obvious to him it wasn't Jews and Gentiles. It were blacks and whites in the American South. And for us today, both groups, them and us, may be totally different. Democrats and Republicans, white and black, liberal, conservative, whatever variation of us versus them you have in mind, the words before us are still true. In his flesh, Christ has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. God has no use for the things that separate us. I want to say that again in case you like to write things down. God has no use for the things that separate us. Whether they be walls, fences, languages, class, status, God has no use for the things that separate us. Which is why Christ has torn them down, and where they once stood, Christ is building something new, something better, something eternal. The household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Paul says, with Christ Jesus Himself as the cornerstone. So may we be people who find no use for the things that seek to divide us. May we be people who seek to break down the fences and barriers that divide us. May we be people who welcome all into the household of God, a family of sisters and brothers with Christ Jesus Himself as the cornerstone, our foundation. And as we tear down that which divides us and live into this reconciliation that is at the heart of our faith in Christ Jesus, may we as a body of believers, broken, imperfect, and flawed though we are, may we truly become the dwelling place of God. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and giver of the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us, O God, when we seek to dwell on the things that divide us.
For Lord, we know and understand as we read in your holy word that you have no use for such things. And that you call us into reconciliation, not only us unto you, but God into reconciliation with one another. So Lord, help us to see past our differences, not to ignore them, not to pretend like they're not there, but to see past them to the thing that unites us all, which is your love, your cross, which made that love so well known and speaks to us even now. So Holy Spirit, come, stir in our presence, stir in our hearts. Help us, O oh God, to make whatever decision we need to make this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.